Welcome to Luma's Work From Home webinar series. Um, I am your usual host, um, Terry Kawaja, but uh, we've got uh, experts far better than me uh, to talk to uh, today's topic, which is the state of mobile apps. You know, for so uh, many in the ecosystem, uh, the app world is just a, it feels like a very uh, different world. Meanwhile, it's exploding. Uh, it was exploding pre-COVID. I think COVID really only just accelerated and, and advanced materially. The uh, explosion of time spent on, on mobile apps, the gaming world is on fire. And it's one of the few areas where we continue to see uh, deal activity all the way uh, through COVID. And uh, today I'm delighted to have uh, my partner, Dick Filippini, um, conduct, uh, host a discussion on the state of mobile apps with uh, expert uh, Eric Sufer. Um, and so uh, do remember this is part of our regular Wednesday work from home webinar series every 2 p.m. Um, and we've been doing this now uh, for two seasons. In fact, coming to the end of uh, season two here with the state of mobile apps. And while we've covered a lot of territory, this comes with a warning folks. Yes, that's right. We are in, you know, fervent contract negotiations with our distributors about the renewal of the work from home webinar series, but it's there's no guarantees that's going to happen. And so very much subject to cancellation. Um, but don't worry. Uh, there is a, another session next Wednesday, uh, June the 17th at 2 p.m. Um, my other uh, partner, uh, Brian Anderson, uh, is going to be uh, hosting a couple of experts uh, from the industry, uh, Penry Price and Gabe Rogel, um, on a discussion about B2B software. So don't, for, don't miss us next Wednesday, June 17th, 2 p.m. Eastern for B2B software. And, you know, look, everything, you know, as circle of life, as things die, new things uh, come up and we'll we are likely uh, to be sunsetting our work from home webinar series. We are replacing it with an interim sort of series of conversations we're calling virtual can conversations. I kicked off the first of which yesterday with Yvonne Markman, a chief business officer at Verizon Media. Stay tuned for more such conversations through the month of June when we would otherwise, you know, be heading to the south of France for conversations on all kinds of topics in and around media and marketing and technology. So uh, getting back to it today, uh, again, I've got my partner, uh, Dick Filippini, who I'm going to turn over the microphone to uh, conduct a discussion about the state of mobile apps. Dick, Eric, welcome and take it away, Dick. Thanks, Terry. And thank you, Eric. Um, Let's jump into trends in the mobile app ecosystem. I saw this cartoon that was called What If the Titanic Sank Today? And it seemed like a good way to set the stage here, a good depiction of the ubiquity and the addiction to mobile. Um, and really excited to uh, have Eric join here. For those of you who don't know him, he spent his career in mobile, uh, started on the growth team at Skype, and then led the growth teams at a couple of uh, uh, super successful game companies, Wooga uh, and Rovio, the Angry Birds guys. He started a growth platform that was acquired by Neil Young's company, Network, and now runs a strategy consulting business that has advised some of the biggest names in gaming, EA, Epic, Google, Unity, um, some of the best mobile players huge, across genres, huge, Rovio, Graham, Quali, MobilityWare, Merca, Outfit7, Redemption, Small Giant, etc. cetera. Um, and investment advisory firms like Goldman Sachs and KKR and Kleiner Perkins and McKinsey. Um, Eric's knowledge in the space is super deep. Um, you can get a bunch of it for free through his site. So sign up for mobiledevmemo.com. Also, also has an awesome Slack community there and Quantmark for more, uh, more practitioners. Um, also has some online education courses that you can sign up for as well. So big thanks for Eric for joining and uh, let's jump into the market. Um, there we go. Um, so eMarketer talks about how time to spend in mobile is, has passed TV, 90% of it's in app. The market is big, continuing to grow at a good clip. Um, advertising is the lion's share today and taking share. It was like 60% in 2018, be 63% this year. Um, 
definitely outpacing the consumer spend. Um, I guess, Eric, you've talked um, a bunch about the movement to from augmenting IAPs to subscription. Anything you want to highlight here in terms of market and trends from that perspective? Yeah, I mean, there was a big uh, sea change kind of around 2017, 2016, a few different factors led um, ad revenue to become kind of a viable sort of company sustaining uh, source of income on mobile. And I think you're definitely seeing that. You're definitely seeing that on the publisher side and then obviously the advertiser side is, is driving a lot of that, right? So there's more inventory now because companies can make, you know, build meaningful businesses via ad sales within their apps. And then um, there's definitely, there was, you know, pent up demand for just kind of more advertising inventory um, on the advertising side. So like, you know, kind of both of those, that, that sort of like um, that, that opening up of, of, of that, uh, of that kind of uh, business model created, I think, you know, this sort of virtuous cycle in terms of just driving a lot more money into to mobile ads. Cool. Well, let's look into the, the app activity here. Uh, here's a snapshot from Sensor Tower of what happened in Q1. Um, obviously, the title of the slide is about TikTok, and the momentum here is astronomical. I mean, they were big before uh, this year, but 315 million downloads across uh, the globe in Q1, um, breaking the record that was set in 20, two, uh, 2016, um, when Pokemon Go launched, I think they were just over 300 million. Um, so super impressive growth there. And they may break that record again this quarter. They've done over 100 million downloads in both April and May. So we'll see what June holds. Um, in terms of other observations, uh, in terms of this activity, it's shocking to me if you look at two, three, and four in terms of the global downloads, it's still all Facebook properties and who are the over 500 million people here that are continuing to download that activity. Um, I think there, it's been well covered kind of the movement to communications apps and streaming entertainment apps, et cetera, during, during the COVID quarantine um, period. But uh, one company that you've had an interesting take on, I know, you know, Disney Plus is number two here in the U.S. and they've continued their impressive momentum since launching. Um, but one that you've been vocal about that doesn't show up on here is Quibi, uh, <laughs> who, who had a bit of a, a different uh, set of results. Wondering if, uh, if you want to talk about that at all. Yeah, that's, that's, probably, that's probably my favorite topic right now. I mean, I, I, could, I, could, I could take up a lot of time talking about that. I think... I think um, the, the sort of main, uh, you know, takeaway from that whole, um, that whole experience for them was just that, you know, they approached that as kind of a content launch, not a platform slash product launch. Um, they, and if you, and I, I wrote a, a post on this, um, uh, called like Quibi's failure to launch, if you, you want to look at that later. But, um, you know, if, if you, if you kind of consider that just the way that they approached the launch was. They invested like like a big Hollywood movie launch, right? They did you know commercials at the Oscars. They they just invested a lot in the kind of you know traditional advertising inventory. Um, and then when they launched the app, and when they did do kind of direct response mobile ads, which is how by the way that's how you that's how you build an audience for a mobile app. It's direct response mobile ads. So you 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 can't. It's really difficult to try to 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 get the funnel to work off of mobile, like to go from TV or to go from out of home or to go to desktop web and to drive installs on mobile is really difficult. Um, but even when they sort of transitioned into the, the sort of mobile DR approach, which they did kind of launch week, um, looking at the ads, I mean, they, they didn't really position this. They positioned this as a pool of content, right? They positioned, the, they positioned Quibi as a portfolio of content, right? A portfolio of TV shows. Um, that, you know, to be honest, weren't really that differentiated aside from having the, the celebrity factor. Um, they didn't position Quibi as a differentiated uh, uh, consumer tech product, right? And I feel like that, that is what consumer, uh, mobile DR, you know, advertising strategy is kind of all about. Like you have maybe three to five seconds um, in a video ad and then, you know, however many fractions of a second with the static to convince somebody that this product is differentiated and interesting in some way. And that's just not the approach they took. And I think, you know, I, I wrote another post recently about how you know, how do you launch a top 100 grossing app on the app store, right? Like, what, 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 is, what is the approach? And I think Quibi kind of is a case study in just how not to do that, right? Whereas Disney Plus did a really great job of that. Um, now, in the case of Disney Plus, they did sort of, they did sort of lead with the content, right? But they, the, the sort of differentiation with Disney Plus is like, hey, you get access to our entire 
back catalog of like Disney movies that, you know, that, that are, uh, you know, the, the most popular content ever created, right. Versus this new, this new, um, this, this new sort of like pool of content, which you're basically rolling the dice on. You, you have no idea if that's going to be worth it or not. And so even with the 90 day free trial, Quibi really didn't manage to gain much traction at launch. I think, but to your point, one, one, one thing to point out uh, on this, on this uh, deck, uh, the slide, maybe two, maybe two things to point out is, yeah, it's amazing that Facebook controls, you know, two, three, and four for global downloads. And, and you see from their earnings report every quarter that, you know, most of their, most of their growth is driven in ROW, but they still control what four, five, and, and, and seven on the US, right? That's still, that's, that's, you know, kind of similarly amazing. Yeah, for sure. Uh, well, let's jump into TikTok since that's a pretty hot topic these days and uh, obviously tons of momentum from uh, download activity. Right. I think, I think TikTok is, um, it's, uh, it's such an interesting use case um, in just kind of the form factor of, uh, you know, merging the content with the ads. Um, and then also like the, the, the sort of um, the format that the ads themselves can take, right? So if you, you know, if you, if you kind of spend some time in TikTok, I spent a lot of time in TikTok just kind of trying to understand the platform. Um, the best performing ads, and having seen this too across, across the, the companies that I work with, the best performing ads look like native content, right? A lot of them are, are filmed with, um, with the iPhone. And I think a great example of this is Bumble. Bumble does a really good job with these types of ads. All, almost all their TikTok ads are filmed natively with an iPhone, um, and they look like content that you might see. Uh, in the app. And I think, um, you know, the hashtag challenge. So this is actually from TikTok, this, uh, these, this uh, slide. Um, the hashtag challenge is a great sort of like native organic format for an ad. Um, and then, you know, having branded effects, that's sort of taking a page out of, out of Snap, uh, you know, in-feed video taking a page out of, out of Facebook. Um, and, you know, top view being just kind of like a, a fairly innovative app format. But I think just given the, given that, given how young this platform is, um, as as an advertising channel they've done like a really amazing job of creating you know the sort of diversity of ad formats um and then they've done a really amazing job of making it uh of just creating a space where it's kind of vital for these ads to feel organic to the content right which people which 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 then users love right um and i think just on the on the platform side they are catching up to facebook very rapidly in terms of the offering right in terms of the self-serve uh portal um, if you think about how, how far they are relative to where Snap was kind of at this, um, you know, at this stage of the growth trajectory, they're, 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 they're very, very far ahead. So they've done an amazing job of just building the products that make the ad experience uh, really easy on the, on the advertiser side, because a lot of these, these uh, platforms are really clunky and hard to use, and then also make them really lucrative, right? They, they, they went very quickly to sort of like event optimized um, at, uh, campaign strategies, which Snap didn't have for a very long time, and which is like the bulk of spend for most advertisers on Facebook. So they've done a really good job of just building the platform. Yeah, and I mean, to your point about um, how Bumble has the look and feel of the native experience in their ads, TikTok does the exact same thing. I think I probably see a dozen TikTok ads through Bungle every day, and it's just the TikTok experience. So they're eating their own dog food from that perspective. Um, let's go to the next section yeah this this is a great quote um so there was an article published yesterday by a company called headlight which is um it's it's my go-to recommendation for as like a mobile growth agency it's run by my friend grant um they do really great work uh anyone who's looking for help you know kind of hands-on uh, uh sort of campaign management help on mobile definitely recommend headlight but they did they just they, they just released this really big kind of study on the TikTok platform, uh, you know, from their experience in using it for the last six months, I definitely recommend reading it. Um, it's on their blog. I don't remember the title, but this is a really great quote. It's uh, mobile marketers specifically will find a toolkit resembling Facebook circa 2017, 2018 with a relatively well-built app install product offering and downstream event optimization in its early stages. And then he goes on to say in the article that TikTok is probably good for about 15 to 20% of incremental spend on mobile, right? So if you if you think about that, you know, the opportunity to sort of spin up 15 to 20% more spend and, you know, hopefully 15, you know, or 20 plus percent more revenue on mobile, like within a week, right? Just getting on board into the TikTok platform. That's, that's the single most important opportunity for, for most mobile advertisers, right? Just that, that, uh, that access to that level of incremental spend is probably the biggest opportunity that any mobile advertiser has, right? And then if you see the advertiser adoption on the right, it's just, it's just, it's exploded, right? Since, you know, Q1 2019. 
Yeah, well, you already addressed my comment on the slide, which is the takeaway at the bottom seems hyperbolic, but uh, for an incremental opportunity, it definitely makes sense. Um, and it's definitely getting the attention. It's, it's the talk of the town, it's the buzz in the, uh, in the press right now. What should advertisers be doing here? Um, in the face of some you know, brand safety concerns, right? It's not different than any other platform. This doesn't seem, these types of issues don't seem to be hindering Facebook at all. Uh, and they're in the press for them every day as well. Um, potentially this uh, uh, regulatory review around COPA, um, I think that TikTok had reached an agreement with the government on um, changing some of their policies with respect to kids and retaining that data, which um, people are alleging they haven't done. So something to keep an eye on. And that's really the existential threat, I think, with the platform is the regulatory review and the US-China and you know, kind of Western hemisphere China relations, particularly this, this um, headline down at the bottom about the CFIUS scrutiny. Uh, CFIUS is the Committee on Foreign Investment in the US that reviews uh, M&A activity and you know, TikTok ByteDance did buy Musical.ly um, and that is under review right now. So uh, CFIUS made the Chinese buyer of Grindr divest that asset. Uh, it's something that you know, we'll see what happens there, but could that same thing happen with Musical.ly and how do you even unravel or untangle the apps there? I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, that's, that's, that's sticky. Uh, I don't know. I mean, you know, there, there have been some pretty high profile kind of you know, U.S. tech uh, thought leaders who have who've made the case. Um, actually, that, that's, that's uh, articulated there um, by the Reddit CEO in the title. Uh, that TikTok is like Chinese spyware. I, I don't know. I mean, I, that's kind of way above my, my pay grade. There was um, a few days ago, I think the ByteDance uh, company said that there was going to be some sort of like domestic data access governance put into place so that like do, do, only domestic engineers, for, for instance, would have access to like domestic data uh, or, or d data from the companies that were uh, sort of headquartered domestically. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what the outcome of that was. I think it was an attempt to kind of stave off um, any regulation. I think that maybe the bigger risk there and having dealt with this uh, extensively at, at, at Rovio is, is COPA, just given how young TikTok skews um, there may be some issues around, you know, data uh, accessibility and, and data usage there that come down from COPA. Um, you know, if it gets classified as, you know, a children's app, which, um, which some, some, some of the Rovio's games had, um, that, that could create some potential difficulties for, for, uh, for ByteDance. And that's how I got to know it. Musical.ly was because my nieces were uh, doing little videos on there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so that, that's how I initially downloaded it. And it morphed over post acquisition. So definitely something to keep an eye on. And uh, I don't think there's any resolution at this point now. Uh, let's jump into COVID a little bit. I mean, I think a lot of this has been covered in the press and in webinars and content everywhere, but um, pretty well trod which, which verticals uh, were affected negatively and positively by quarantine. Um, the fact that brand spend massively pulled back and that had an impact on CPMs, which performance guys jumped into to take, take advantage of. Um, but over on the right, you can see those trends starting to come back to mainstream. So uh, definitely want to get your take on it, which you've been vocal on. Yeah, so th this article in particular, app download data suggests we have passed peak quarantine. I mean, I, I just tracked. Um, so a couple months, like maybe six six weeks to two months ago, I had, I had done kind of an analysis of downloaded chart positions for a bunch of apps. And you, there was a pretty clear delineation between, you know, which apps were, were sort of being adversely affected by COVID in terms of installs and, and, and revenue, and then which apps were kind of benefiting from it. Uh, Unity and Adjust actually just released a study today um, showing that hyper-casual gaming installs increased by like 75% over COVID. But, but I just kind of pointed out like, hey, there's some pretty drastic uh, changes that have, that have, that have, uh, that have, that have uh, materialized as a result of COVID. Well, this, this, in this article, I, I just revisited those same charts and basically everything had reverted to pre-COVID, right? So you saw Airbnb went back to basically its same install rank uh, as it, that, it, that it held pre-COVID, Uber, Lyft, um, all the companies that were getting like kind of punished by COVID um, basically saw their sort of fortunes reverse. Uh, so it's really interesting to see that happen and then and then kind of 
you know, as yeah, the, well, this was I think the, the, the loser's chart from the first. Um, but I mean, the, you know, these dramatic drops in across a bunch of different verticals, um, and then basically a lot of that just reversed as of you know three four three weeks ago when you know when the restrictions were starting to lift. Um, and people were starting to kind of go outside again and, and, you know, approach, you know, something, you know, uh, resembling a normal life. Um, so it wasn't, I don't, you know, these changes, I think like part of the hypothesis was that this was going to drive kind of permanent changes in user behavior. I don't know that it did. Um, and then I think one, one sort of, uh, confounding factor in interpreting a lot of the data that was getting shared during the COVID about, you know, CPMs and about engagement rates and about installs numbers was that, you know, a lot of people are just bored, right? And they were just tourists and they were downloading stuff just because they had free time on their hands. I think where you saw a lot of increased install rates, um, you tended to not see a lot of increased engagement. And that, you know, just talking about that hyper casual report, yeah, maybe this 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 uh, sort of subgenre saw a lot of uh, a big surge in installs during COVID, but the CPMs had sort of bottomed out. Right. So I don't know that that necessarily maps to a big, you know, one to one increase in revenue. Um, and in fact, I spoke with um, the CEO of a, of a fairly uh, big kind of idol gaming studio um, maybe two weeks ago. And he said that they were basically revenue flat over COVID, even even though their, their install numbers had surged. Their CPMs had fallen by such an extent that they were basically just they were treading water. They weren't they weren't making a lot more money than, than they, than they were before. COVID. Yeah. You can see that in the Mopub piece here where casual games are up, mid core games are all benefiting from COVID, but hyper casuals mm -hmm. flat because they monetize via ads. So mm -hmm. uh, the, the increase, the benefit that they can get from lower cost uh, inventory is offset by uh, the monetization vehicle. Yeah. Here was an interesting survey that you ran uh, relatively recently, right? Yeah. I ran this, I think maybe two weeks ago. Um, just, just, within the mobile dev memo community. And um, there were more questions. I think these were pretty interesting though. The app revenue change in 2020 and relative to 2019, see about a quarter say it increased dramatically, uh, the, you know, the half increased slightly. And then the last quarter uh, uh, stayed either consistent or decreased. Um, 2020 spend though is, is different, right? So uh, you see about 14%, uh, uh, you know, combined, almost 50% combined say less. Uh, or the same, more than 50% say less or the same. And then, you know, about 50% uh, say, say more. Um, and then, you know, I, I wanted to get a sense of people's just optimism around the labor market. Um, and I think, you know, here you don't see a whole lot of pessimism, at least in mobile advertising, which tends, tends to be um, kind of a, a seller's market in terms of labor. So uh, that's, that's kind of an awkward way of saying, you know, em employer, employees, have a lot of options. Um, so, uh, you know, people are mostly just optimistic. If they lost their job, they don't feel that, you know, it would be hard to find a new one. And I mean, I certainly helped companies interview a lot of people that had, had been laid off during COVID. And I think they were kind of spoiled for choice. So, I mean, even though, you know, it was a tough time for certain sectors, um, I don't think it really changed the overall sort of trajectory of the sort of mobile advertising space um, in a meaningful, like long-term way. Let's hope not, um, and let's jump into gaming. Uh, snapshot again from Sensor Tower of downloads uh, at a publisher level in Q1 over here, and you can see the prevalence of games, Voodoo, App 11. I mean, how impressive is App 11? I think Adam told me probably two, two and a half years ago, he had a new way to inflect the business, and by getting into gaming and having this chart position here, it's super impressive execution, um, <laughs> you know, very interesting to see the MZ acquisition the other week and uh, looking back from five years ago, how, uh, how the world has evolved. But ticking down a list, Crazy Lab, Say Games, Plagendary, Aminodes, Good Job, Player X, Easy Brain, on and on and on. Tons of uh, game pubs in the top of the charts from a download perspective, but also from a grossing perspective. That's why uh, the titles punch above their weight. Um, this is Afani on the right looking at, you know, a third to 40% of downloads are games, but from a spend perspective, it's even more than that. And that's still where a ton of the activity remains. Um, so I know you have more to say about that and, and mobile trends specifically. Yeah, I think just to, just to uh, 
tag along on your point, like Apple Oven is, is probably the most impressive company I've ever like witnessed um, yeah. from, you know, the sidelines. It's just an amazing company, awesome leadership, super, super disciplined execution, uh, super focused. Um, and it's just like a growth slash money machine. Um, I think, you know, the, the, the hyper casual thing, I don't know. I, I called the bottom like uh, six months ago, I, I think for, for this year, I don't know how, Hyper casual seems tough because, you know, it just if you look at the moves a lot of those companies have made after they've, you know, seen that's, you know, this kind of initial success with hyper casual, they're all sort of trying to diversify outside of hyper casual. And like, why, well, why would you do that? Right. If you had a, if you truly had a competitive advantage in hyper casual, you wouldn't. Um, and I think the reason for that is you, it's almost impossible to have a, a, a competitive advantage in hyper casual. I know, I know a lot of those companies are moving into building like platforms, um, you know, so that you could kind of just, you know, you know, programmatic uh, procedural way, launch games, sometimes build games procedurally. I don't know. I, that to me doesn't seem like a scalable uh, endeavor, but I, you know, I'm, I've been wrong before. Um, I think hi hyper casual, it's just a space. It feels like where people just sort of trade positions and, and, uh, and lose momentum and gain momentum in sort of a zero sum way. Right. I think, you know, if you look at voodoo, like they basically just sort of stepped into the position that catch up held. Right. And so these, these, these companies, I think when they try to either outgrow this sort of hyper casual space and like lose focus on that, or they just get acquired, they tend to lose steam. Um, but, but mobile gaming is a behemoth. Um, and it's, it's only set kind of for more growth. I love this chart on the right. It's from uh, Matthew Ball, um, just showing kind of games, uh, consumer spend over time. And then you just see mobile just blow up. Uh, going into to, to 2019. And I that, that that trajectory has not sort of abated whatsoever. I mean, mobile games are expected. I think App Annie, something like 200 and uh, something billion in 2020 ex expected in, in terms of revenue. Um, I did a study a couple, or I study, I did like a, an analysis a couple, like maybe a year ago, um, where I tried to estimate the size of the mobile games advertising market. And I, I came to, to 100 billion. Um, and that was kind of from a top down and bottoms up uh, perspective. Well, and you can do that. Not, yeah. not everyone wants to reach these these slackers sitting home taking bong hits and playing uh, playing <laughs> console games in their in their parents' basement, right? Yeah, that's true. It's uh, I mean obviously tongue in cheek there. It's a cliche, but it's annoying that we have to cover it. But it's you know you're still seeing Ad Colony out there talking about this dynamic when you know their research shows this is the typical gamer, right? They I think they said the a average gamer skews female. 39 years old, over indexes, it's like two thirds of them identify as heads of household that drive purchase decisions. This is where brands should be. Um, I mean, who doesn't play games, right? And, and this is where eyeballs are, particularly within this industry, it's, it's casual games, people funds, wordscapes, you know, this is happy color, Merge Dragons by Zynga. I mean, the bottom two mobility where solitaire games, I mean, the one on the left, I think that was one of the first titles ever in the App Store, and it's still a dominant inventory source for, for everyone out there. So, I mean, reality is games are the place to be. Um, we had a panel at DMS last May where Dave Madden from EAA led a discussion, and he's super excited about the potential in eSports and Apex Legends, those types of games. It's, you know, really interesting developing op opportunities there, but they require some planning and experimentation, et cetera. Um, these titles, they're scaled, they're open for business today, and it's a great way for brands to come in and reach the, uh, the consumers that they're trying to get. Um, and, you know, you think about it, you know, if Dick's sitting inside the happy color game, um, how are you going to know that you're targeting me as opposed to, I mean, I'm probably not the best demo contextually for that, but the power of the phone and what what you are able to get off there, even from a non-PII perspective, you know, thinking about the power of app, gra app graphs or if you track any behavioral activity there, it's so compelling and such a good opportunity for the world to wake up to, um, to be able to go reach people. There's just a treasure trove of t targeting information today that might be changing. Um, there's been tons of coverage around, uh, uh, the Google Chrome announcement about third-party cookies following the other browsers and speculation around, does that happen with the mobile ad IDs? Um, I know you've, you've covered that as well. I think it was a post called Apocalypse Soon that there are changes coming. What's your current view on, on potential changes in the, uh, from, from the identifier perspective? 
Uh, I have less conviction now that'll happen in 2020, just given COVID. But I mean, I think I would say very, very high conviction that it happens before the end of 2021. And it's interesting. And, you know, what, what's going to be the alternative there, right? Because identifiers aren't just creepy. They have an important role in the world from targeting, frequency capping, measurement, et cetera. The shot on the left, like this is, I don't know, a handful of years ago, I turned on limit ad tracking, LAT on Apple. It doesn't stop ads coming and it just stops you getting relevant ones. So here I'm getting a Snickers commercial, which video, which, you know, maybe is relevant, but it's in Spanish. So you're just, uh, you're, you're inviting a more negative experience. And, you know, am I really going to be that bullheaded that I keep LAT on? Um, these other dynamics, you know, measurement, like how are advertisers supposed to know how their ads can perform? Um, and, and how are they supposed to get credit for actually delivering performance in the space? So it's a really interesting decision. Um, if they do make a change, will they bring in some kind of alternate identifier that's maybe less persistent than IBFA, but still allows you to reach these very important um, goals here? Yeah, well, I mean, that was the purpose of LAT, right? I feel like LAT does a great job of giving users that control. So, I mean, I'm not a huge proponent of getting rid of the ad IDs. I agree. Um, any thoughts on SK Ad Network, Apple's, uh, Apple's effort there? Yeah, well, I think that that was a kind of, the, uh, that did presage this, right? So, I mean, I wrote about that, the SK Ad Network being the way that um, you could basically skip the attribution party and uh, uh, attribute just the ad install without any sort of like PII being passed around and not, so, and also alleviating the need for the ad ID. I, th I think that is the lever that they use to get rid of the ad ID, I just think, I, I don't, I don't, I don't agree with the decision to get rid of the ad ID, but I think it's inevitable. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's not the end of the world if, it, if it's, uh, well, I guess we I skipped a slide here. Um, I don't think people hate ads, number one. Here's an uh, e-marketer thing, and it's a little bit stale. Um, but, you know, consumers' views on an acceptance towards various formats. But the stuff on the right, I think this was App Annie, maybe in conjunction with Facebook Audience Network, looking at the impact of um, putting ad SDKs into apps and what happened. I, it's counterintuitive to me that, that downloads activity hours spent would increase after you put in an ad SDK, but the fact that um, it's not dropping off a cliff off there makes a ton of sense to me. I think people are comfortable with the value exchange. They recognize uh, that trade off and think it's fair. Um, and to the point that I was gonna make on LAT, I mean, I think Vungle's put out a post on this that uh, they see a much higher ROAS, day, day seven ROAS from LAT users. I think it was like north of 30% higher. And I think their view there is this is a more sophisticated um, audience, the folks that are turning it on. Um, but more interesting is, is the top left post from you and, and Mobile Park are covering this as well. What is Apple up to uh, with expanding search ads? Right. So the, the background on this is that Apple um, basically expanded the, the, the API for search ads. It allowed, uh, it allowed inventory to be sold in other apps, right? And so you started seeing the Apple ASA ads appearing in other types of apps like news apps and that kind of thing. Um, and so my hypothesis there is that, okay, well, they realize that if they, if they end up um, removing the um, IDFA, Right. If they remove the a a advertising identifier, um, then they are the only ones with that kind of proprietary access to the user data. Right. And so they would have an, like the, the prime, they'd be, have a prime position to sort of now scale up an ad network and sort of eat into that gigantic advertising market because they'd be the closest people to the user and they'd have, they'd be the, the only company with that kind of targeting data. Uh, so that was kind of my thesis there. Yeah. And I mean, Super interesting dynamic. I mean, the the sliver kind of top left, 11 o'clock or so, is Apple Search Ads share of a wallet. This is from an AppSumer report. Um, it's small, and it's certainly tons of headroom to grow, but removing the identifier, what's the impact that has on the big blue and the big red boxes, Google and Facebook? Um, could, could be a really interesting change that's on the horizon here. 
Right. And I mean, you know, this, this basically maps what I've seen in terms of advertiser spend. App, Apple is generally good for between like five and 10% of, of, U, of UA budget, right? And so I think they can meaningfully increase that and eat into uh, Facebook and Google. But, you know, also, I mean, they could just uh, take over a lot of like Snapchat and, and Liftoff's programmatics, probably they wouldn't eat into that. But yeah, this is a pretty, I think it's a big opportunity for them. Yeah, for sure. Um, and uh how will the world react to it? It's, uh, you know, if targeting becomes more challenged, I mean, creative is hugely important today. This is something that Sumly did, I think just yesterday in a webinar, looking at the top studios in the US by budget and look at the number of creatives that people are running there. I mean, King almost 2,500 there. Um, it's super important to test and optimize your creative strategy and, you know, gets to some interesting dynamics. I, I, you've talked about this. It's uh, it's annoying to me that there's fake ads out there that don't represent the gameplay at all, but they seem to work quite well and drive a lot of conversions. Um, but you got to stay on top of your game from the creative standpoint. Uh, it's a quote from AppLevin in here. It's like, it's such a copycat game. It's not even just on the, I mean, the ads are now following what's happened in, in gaming where everyone's copying everyone else's success uh, and benefiting from it. So, um, I think it's going to heighten the, the importance of creative for sure. Um, and uh, I know we talked about potentially touching on some of the different formats. There's a healthy range of stuff out there for uh, advertisers, depending on kind of your, your budget and your campaign goals from uh, lower engagement and cheaper to higher engagement and more expensive. Um, any trends you want to touch on from, uh, from a format perspective? Uh, yeah, I think rewarded video, I mean, is probably most, so it, it, it's, this is very like genre centric, right? So there's, there's, there's kind of context specific. I mean, gaming, I'd say rewarded video is probably the lion's share. It's the bread and butter of advertising uh, formats. And then, you know, statics, uh, you, you, you see uh, kind of like health, health, fitness, lifestyle apps, uh, being more dependent on those. And, and playables are mostly just gaming and AR uh, could kind of go across the board. So it's, it's interesting to see how these break down across genre lines. Yep. And we'll touch on that a little bit more. Um, I think kind of main takeaway from, from this page is um, whether you're looking at it from the pub perspective, the marketer perspective or consumers, um, I think there's broad acceptance and, and success with video, uh, whether it's rewarded or, or, or not and, and, and playables as well. They seem to be you know, highly engaging formats that uh, that perform well, kind of across the uh, the market constituents, um, and back to the point about suitability towards brands. I mean, playable ads. This is one that Trey Sensa developed in conjunction with Snap for Reese's, um, and and turned Pac-Man into a Reese's game where you know Pac-Man was a Reese's peanut butter cup eating Reese's pieces. Um, but it, you know, people opted in to engage with this unit for an average of a minute and a half across millions of users. Where else do brands get people to go proactively engage with their brand? It's, it's an incredible opportunity. Uh, and to your point on rewarded video being dominant in gaming, uh, I think this is a drum article on Activision Blizzard Media Group um, and how they're trying to get more people into rewarded from a brand perspective and diversify the audience there. Uh, I know you've, uh, I mean, Activision Blizzard, they bought one of our clients, Z2, uh, who, who Paradise Bay, their title was the test bed for them to go run games. And uh, Activision didn't want to cannibalize it all by running uh, competitive game ads and, and potentially losing users. Uh, so they've been focused on um, brands, but that was 2015. It's been a long time coming. I know you have ex some experience with brand advertising in games from, uh, from Rovia, the Angry Birds day. What, uh, what do you want to share there? Well, just, we tried to do one of those integrations. We had set it, we had built the game to allow for that in like a really native way. So it, was, it didn't feel like an ad, the, 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 the brand's ad was integrated into the gameplay and we sold a really big one ahead of launch to, to Cheerios, but it was just so hard to, on, to, to get any other big brands in the pipeline. Um, that I think we ended up just shutting that kind of initiative down. I think the brands are, are kind of the, the sort of like, um, you know, the, the principal subscribers to that idea that, you know, a gamer is that kid in his, in his, uh, in his basement playing uh, Call of Duty versus, you know, the 40-year-old the woman who's the household decision maker. 
Yep. Well, it's a, it's, it's a huge opportunity. Hopefully this COVID dynamic will let people um, experiment a little bit more with lower CPMs and, and realize the benefits. Um, it seems to be top of mind and two articles from yesterday talking about brands moving into the space. So hopefully that dynamic continues. Uh, we've seen some success for it with uh, Pandora and Spotify. Um, I mean, this is a while ago where Pandora launcher, launched an ad unit called Sponsored Listening. Um, for the users, it was called uninterrupted un listening. You engage with a rewarded video ad for you know, X number of seconds, 15 to 60 seconds, and get an hour of uninterrupted Pandora, uh, which was a win-win-win kind of across the, uh, the ecosystem for the consumer, the brand, and, um, and the user. Um, you got to respect that contract. <laughs> when I, I was looking in, uh, in Twitter for uh, feedback on these more recently, and there's been some negative comment commentary with respect to uh, Spotify, where someone takes that step, watches the ad and expects an hour free and then gets an ad in five minutes or so. So um, that's obviously uh, not a great experience, but um, I think it's a huge opportunity and beyond music streaming apps, it should be everywhere. Every time I see a paywall, it just drives me nuts. Like give me a, give me a 30 second video and let me go read the story that I'm trying to see. Um, so I think there's a ton of headroom in the market for rewarded and, and these other units that we're seeing so much success for with gaming um, for brands to come into the space. Um, and, and if you think about it from their perspective, you know, I think a lot of brands struggle with the high CPMs um, or pricing of rewarded video, but you get what you pay for, right? Look at the fall off in completion rates for interstitial video and native video relative to rewarded. You're engaging with rewarded because you're going to get the reward. And I think the 100% viewership there is still like 93%. It's well over 90%. So there's not a ton of, of fall off from there. Um, and you should be willing to pay more for that kind of results. Um, from a playables perspective, uh, this is one of the playables firms on the left looking at their Facebook spend from playables versus other um, units. and. Uh, click-through rates and conversion rates, you know, pretty dramatically higher. Uh, the charts on the right are an, an IDC report that just came out in the last week or two, I think, commissioned by Facebook Audience Network, um, showing a ton of activity in the space. I mean, the numbers look crazy high to me. I don't know what your perspective is. Uh, I, I know there's good activity and good engagement and benefit around the units, but uh, w w what are your thoughts on, you know, 60% of mobile ad budget for game players going into playables in 2020. I mean, that just, that just can't possibly be true, especially for the non-game app developers. But I, I don't know that this is necessarily like a growth sector. I feel like it's kind of, some, it's like a stable, um, it's just, a, it's just it's a stable portion of the market, right? I, I don't see that it, it's growing too much. And I mean, I think a lot of, you know, big game advertisers spend on, on playables, but they're hard to they're hard to 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 replace, right? Because it's a lot of dev dev work, right? And they're expensive. Uh, they work okay, but they tend to work better for core games. So it's I don't know that it's like it's definitely not this meaningful of a percentage of spend, and I don't know that there's a huge growth trajectory to this to this particular format. Uh, I don't know if you know the Luna Labs guys, but they've got a nice engine that'll take any game built on the Unity engine um, and transform it into HTML5. So it could be an ad unit or a playable game or anything like that, but really doing some interesting work to automate that as well. So you've talked about AR. We highlighted that a little bit earlier. Um, I have to turn on my... Oh. <laughs> Snapchat experience like this is not a fad this is a real thing there's a there there's great um results that come out of snap camera and these lenses i mean we're a little bit biased it's our uh, our client that uh that that built those units um victor from from luxury um but i mean snap has got so much momentum with these units this is a post that, that you put out recently kind of talking about uh pokemon go um but Snap's got what, approaching 250 million DAUs now. 75% of them engage with the AR filters on a daily basis. Uh, and it's up like 85% their, their usage year over year, they just reported in their uh, most recent earnings. And there's a range of different 
add opportunities here. Um, the Playdemic one for Golf Clash here is direct response. I think they've done a real nice job of getting DR into the platform. It's moved from being brand to, in the most recent quarter, it was over 50% um, performance. Um, and, and a range of different opportunities. I mean, this McDonald's uh, campaign in Saudi Arabia, they were trying to get ap applicants for um, people to work at McDonald's. In 24 hours, they got 43,000 people to submit. So it's powerful kind of across the range of, of what your goals are, for sure. And I guess another thing that's important to talk about moving beyond uh, creatives, creatives, you know, if identifiers change, creative is going to be increasingly important. But so is incrementality. Um, do you want to talk about this one? Right. So this is from Uber's lawsuit against its um, agency partner. No, this was after that. This was so Uber had 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 filed suit against its agency partner, and then I think it dropped that suit or it settled it, and then it filed suit against okay. the ad platforms that the agency partner was working with directly. Um, and but just to contextualize this uh, image on the left, so this is paid spend is the green uh, uh, area chart. Uh, uh, paid signups is the red line, and you see as once paid spend drops, the so paid signups drop as you'd expect, but then the organic signups uh, increase, and so they're basically at the same level as they were at the high level of spend in terms of total signups, which is the the black line. The black line is pretty stable, even though spend drops because uh, the organic kind of replaced the paid, which kind of leads one to believe that these ad partners were doing a lot of like organic poaching. Um, in their media buying, which, and which is why Uber ultimately filed suit, but like incrementality, um, you know, if they had been doing incrementality testing, they would have noticed that. Uh, I think it's, it's pretty much the biggest topic in mobile measurement, not, not in small part because of this fear of, Hey, if these advertising IDs go away, the only way we'll be able to sort of operate, you know, our, our, our ad spend in a sort of performance minded way is to have an incrementality mechanic that constantly tests, when we push budget over here, we get more incremental installs. When we push budget over here, we get fewer and, and, and then finds the, the right sort of uh, distribution of budget that way. So incrementality is super, super important right now. Yeah, I mean, I think there's been some perverse incentives in the ecosystem historically with it. And uh, that'll certainly change if the identifiers go away. But uh, Celtra worked with Uber around their incrementality stuff. Uh, you know, Uber loved it. They were promoting it heavily and Seltzer was trying to get other people to adopt it. They'd go do these tests with some pretty big brands out there and prove to them, you're not getting much incrementality. And the growth manager would say, thank you very much. Here's your check. Don't tell anyone about this. Go away. Right. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, interesting to see how it plays out. Um, and I guess our last topic is header bidding and how that, how that works in the mobile world. It was you know, a ton of buzz five years ago about flattening the waterfall in the desktop world. And it just drove to this massive war in 2016 with everyone competing to be the header bidding solution of choice. Um, so what's going on with in-app bidding? Uh, I think this Mopub graphic on the left is, is pretty indicative of what it was. Last year was kind of a beta testing environment where people were proving out the value. Um, the chart in the middle kind of looks at their advanced bidding versus the standard waterfall during one of their COVID reports. It's more performant. This uh, part on the right is through a webinar I watched a couple weeks ago with Max uh, F11 solution and people fund the biggest word game, mobile word game developer out there. Um, and pretty impressive results that they saw. I mean, th th these guys were, you know, John is a pro. He is a regular commentator on your Slack channel. Uh, they know what they're doing. They had a pretty sophisticated waterfall set up, but post implementing Max, they saw some pretty incredible um, results. Uh, number of impressions went up 50% with lower latency. ArcDAO was up 25 to 30% across the portfolio. Um, more real-time visibility into which demand sources are driving value through the A-B testing tools and really efficiency in waterfall management. They cut out a thousand line items across their apps um, through there, which frees up a ton of time to go focus on what you do best, your core competency, which is making games and optimizing the user experience. Um, I guess any, any thoughts on that before we jump to one more commentary on uh, in-app editing? 
Well, just that, you know, it's every, all the big mediation companies are moving this way too. I think um, it, it feels like it's just kind of a no brainer from a, just a, to, yeah, I mean, a, ta that's, a time perspective, right? Yeah. To John's point, like, I, I don't know why you wouldn't be doing this. You're missing out. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, and I think that's the point of the next slide. It's, it's, it's time to get into it. It's going to drive a ton of performance for uh, developers from a monetization standpoint, but we're still not there. This was uh, Minigrel, uh, I know you know them, but for the audience, uh, you know, a, a nicely performant DSP. It's uh, one, of the, one of the biggest bidders on uh, Max and Mopub and, and Iron Source and Fiverr, et cetera. Um, they ran a webinar with those four participants from the, from the supply side um, just last week. And here's um, some views into the commentary from the audience, which is kind of all growth practitioners. You know, is Google ever going to get into here? And I think the thesis, we didn't include all of it in here, is they're going to continue to push their own solution. But down at the bottom, I mean, Apple Oven's obviously bidding in their own stuff. Um, in Mobi's getting into this, Verizon's getting into it. But there's a lot of people that still aren't in the space. Um, and it seems like rather than fighting for waterfall position, going in and competing with everyone on a level footing makes sense for the demand sources. Sure, there's some technical investment that you got to put in to get there, but um, what's your view on how this continues to evolve over the course of this year? Uh, well, I just, I mean, I think it's just going to continue to grow and, I, you know, it'll, it'll be an, a more important part of the sort of ad revenue mix. I, I don't, um, yeah, it just, it just feels like, like to, just to John's point, it's a no-brainer, so I think it'll keep going in that direction. Awesome. Well, that's the end of the slides. I know we uh, covered a lot and it's very high level. Um, so I don't see where the Q&A is here. Oh, we do have some Q&A, so we can look at that and see if there's questions. But yeah. I do think, um, you know, if you want to dig in at a more granular level, hit up Eric. He's the practitioner. Here's his book, Freemium Economics. So uh, definitely worth a read. And all of his resources, like uh, I'm on them quite regularly. Um, Terry, I know you were jumping in. Yeah, no, I was just going to kick things off with uh, Q and A, and just ask you guys before we go to the uh, submitted questions. Uh, obviously, K K private equity firms like KKR and Blackstone have made material investments in this sector. What do you think is the their investment thesis, uh, looking particularly at mobile app monetization plays? Uh, Dick, Eric's consulted for some of these people. <laughs> you want to take a first crack? Sure. I think, well, I think each, if you kind of look at these, uh, you know, for their own merits, I think Vungle was kind of in a distressed situation. Um, but also, I mean, it's just a big growth sector, right? So I, I also consulted for a few um, hedge funds that were participating. In, Unity did a big secondary placement like a year and a half ago. So I, I helped some some institutional investors think through that. I mean, it's just a growth sector. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's almost, in Bungle, I mean, I think the price was really attractive. I mean, 700 million. Um, it, uh, it, it feels, it, you know, it feels like there's, there's just only upside there. Um, so I, I wouldn't see, you know, and, and, and there's ways to make them more efficient. So it's, it feels like a kind of perfect private equity, you know, play. What would you say, uh, Eric, to there's a lot of folks in the marketing ecosystem that have a sort of dated view of, uh, you know, mobile apps and, and gaming as being very, very different, very niche from the broader world of, of marketing. And yet, for, from our perspective, that sector is A, large, B, growing, and C, has probably been on the leading edge of innovation uh, around some of the, the the ways to monetize and engage uh, consumers. What advice would you have for people playing in the general media world that have perhaps historically poo-pooed the, the mobile app uh, sector? I mean, if you want a way to reach every single person on the planet, it's gaming. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, you look at the growth of Fortnite, you look at the growth, but even like, look at a company like PeopleFun, I mean, they're huge. And you probably have not heard of that company, but uh, chances are you've seen one of their games. Um, the, the word games, especially, they're just sleepers, right? Like they, they reach so many people. Um, I, I think it just, it just feels like, you know, you, you, at some point you've got to kind of come around to the reality, which is that, you know, games are mass market and they're not, you know, for kids. They're for mostly adults. They're for mostly women. 
Um, you know, look at a company like Playrix. It's, you know, people are talking about a valuation of $9 billion. They make homescapes, gardenscapes. Those skew, you know, those skew like uh, majority women. Um, it's just an awesome way to reach household decision makers, household budget owners um, it, it, with, with very direct messaging that, you know, you can, you can uh, uh, lead to sort of any sort of endpoint that you want. Yep. So, so a, a, an attractive and, and, broad, and broad demo. Um, Charles uh, Bookwalter asks a question about um, the relative sort of importance um, of uh, mobile devices versus smart TVs in terms of consumption of sort of video slash TV uh, content. You, I, I know you guys shared some perspectives in, in, a, in an earlier webinar on streaming. We, we talked about the sort of the co-viewing uh, of those two uh, device channels. Any commentary on the relative importance of those two? Uh, Dick? Well, Terry, you're the, you're the smart TV expert. I, I don't know if I've watched TV in six weeks. <laughs> I haven't even watched the Michael Jordan documentary yet. So everything that I'm watching is on my phone. You're, you're, uh, all, you're all in on, you're all in on mobile. Uh, all in on mobile. It's, yeah, uh, I, think, I think when you, when you, uh, when you look at the research, uh, it shows that rarely are we, uh, if we are using the big rectangle on the wall in the living room, it's, it's almost a perfect coincidence of also having our mobile phone uh, with us either for ad breaks or co-viewing. So it feels like if you want ubiquity, you know, mobile, mobile seems to be uh, taking a, a larger and larger share. Uh, obviously a lot of gaming is happening on mobile, but Charles follows up with a question about how much gaming is, is taking place on, on TVs. Oh, for, for desktop? Um, yeah, I mean, all of it, <laughs> I guess. Actually, I, I saw an interesting stat that desktop, or uh, sorry, uh, uh, console. Uh, console gaming downloads grew uh, to a larger degree than mobile gaming downloads did during COVID. I thought that was, that was quite interesting. Yeah, well, I guess we're at home, right? So I guess if you have a small rectangle in your hand, a large rectangle on the wall, People, uh, people tend to opt for the larger one. We're also seeing this similar trend in terms of desktop usage uh, yeah. versus mobile, a sort of bit of a resurgence since you're, you're, you're at home and not necessarily just on the go. As a related question to that, there is a bunch of folks in the sort of CTV world that are licking their chops about the potential opportunity for uh, ad monetization in console gaming, uh, I'm 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 more I'm cautiously optimistic, but perhaps with more of an emphasis on caution, just because that's a that's a new channel and it always takes longer to develop a, a new channel. What's your uh, what's your perspective on that opportunity? Well, Riot just launched uh, a, a project to do that in League of Legends to buy up ads in the games. Also, Activision has a pretty interesting initiative going on there. Um, Apps Flyer has a new podcast that they launched and they just interviewed the, the, the person who's leading that. It was, it's a really good podcast. I would recommend everyone, everyone uh, listen to it, but he's talking about how do, how do we bring ads into the game, into the console gaming experience? I think it's, I don't know. I feel like it, that's, that's more of a branded play. Obviously it's not going to be a direct response uh, thing, but I think, you know, given the size of league of legends, right? If you got your ad in a league of legends match in one of those tournaments where there's, you know, they fill out like LA stadium or whatever, that feels like a pretty good opportunity to reach a bunch of people. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think it's more involved. I mean, you see the co-sponsorships of the conference or the concerts in, in Fortnite. Um, good success for Nike, but that's not, you know, something that you turn on spend overnight and go get yeah. a bunch of users. It's a, it's, a, it's a much more involved um, activity that takes a lot of planning. Yeah, right. Different opportunity, but huge. And maybe uh, finally, are, are you seeing um, what are you seeing a a trend or a concentration in the type of advertiser that's that's uh, taking advantage of mobile apps? Either uh, a mobile app advertiser, sort of like an endemic uh, advertiser, or you know, uh, are we seeing uh, you know media companies, mo movie trailers being being advertised? What, what is or D to C brands? Is there a particular type of mobile, uh, type of advertiser taking advantage of the uh, opportunity in the channel? 
Well, D2C is blown up. Um, I think D2C uh, is facing a lot of headwinds right now. Um, and I think they're kind of, uh, the footprint is being reduced in, in sort of like the direct response mobile, like the biggest direct response mobile channel, especially Facebook. I would say gaming is number one, probably with, you know, more than 50% of share. Um, but a lot of, you know, lifestyle apps, um, you know, especially lifestyle subscription apps have found like uh, scalable paths to, to, to sort of like profitable, you know, user acquisition performance marketing spend. And so those are becoming more meaningful, right? Like you think about Calm, Headspace, they're big spenders. Um, and there's a, there are a lot of examples of those types of apps that spend a lot of money. Um, and I feel like, you know, gaming always tends to kind of lead the adoption of these new sort of inventory formats, but other companies are, you know, they follow pretty quickly. Awesome. Well, Dick, Eric, uh, that was a solid hour of uh, deep insights into uh, mobile gaming. Thank you, Dick, for hosting. Thank you, Eric, Eric for your uh, expert commentary. Uh, this concludes our work from home webinar on the state of mobile apps. Please join us next Wednesday, June 17th for a discussion of B2B uh, software uh, uh, with uh, my partner, Brian Anderson, hosting. Thank you, Thank you all for joining.